Welcome to a short time of reflection this Sunday, the 27th of December 2020. This video replaces our regular Sunday morning service and offers rest to all those involved in our regular services. <coughs> in particular, Jeanette and Paul, who have worked so hard to lead the church forward through such an unprecedented and challenging year. Our theme this morning is restoration. And you know, the world may be falling apart, but God delights in positive change, repair and healing. Jesus Christ came to earth as a baby to put things right. So in a sense, Jesus the carpenter is in the restoration business. And more on that later. And here we are, we're standing at a junction between two years. 2020 defined by COVID and lockdown and ahead of us 2021 with an uncertain future outside the EU but with the hope of vaccines and an eventual end to tears and lockdowns and when I say tears I'm thinking of the geographical tears as well as the, the crying kind. <laughs> This video contains elements of a church service but also includes a focus on mental health and practical advice about managing our own mental health and helping those we meet in 2021 who are struggling. We will also explore spirituality and faith in a mental health context with the help of my daughter Miranda who's an occupational therapist at uh, the uh, local acute inpatient hospital in heaven. I'm going to begin this um, service or, or whatever we want to call it <clears throat> with uh, a few verses from Isaiah 60 and it says there Arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you and nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So I'm just going to open in prayer. Father God, we have seen much darkness this year. Lord, we ask you to shine your holy light upon our church community here in Crookhall. Help us to continue to light up Crookhall. And let 2021 be a new dawn, not only for people locally, but for our whole nation and the world. Amen. We now come to our reading. And I'm going to ask my dear wife here, Vivian, to read for us. The readings taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendour in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Well done. And I'm just going to give my wife a, a piece of her favourite black chocolate as a reward for such a wonderful reason. That was my fee. <laughs> God always wants to bless us <clears throat> and he wants us to discover who we really are in him. And the passage that Viv just read to us is all about restoration. 
Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. And then Isaiah 62 verse 2 says, The Lord will call you by a new name. He will give you a new name. And then verse 3 says that God sees us as a crown of splendour in his hand. So, you know, the message is that we are precious to him and we are better than we could ever possibly imagine. We are full of potential, all of us. And God is in the restoration business. God wants to restore us to what we were created to be. And, you know, often when we restore an old building, we may typically add modern features as well as rather than trying to simply recreate the building as it was in the past. If we're restoring a church, we may well, you know, a lot of features, we will try and make them exactly as they were before, but we may well choose to build, uh, put new seating in if we're allowed, or certainly to put a modern porch in or a modern hall on the side uh, to meet the needs of today. So typically with an old building, we might put in electricity and central heating which wasn't there before. So restoration isn't just about making things as they were in the past. It's about actually changing them and, re and making them ready for future needs. <clears throat> just give you an example. Re recently, my poor wife uh, fell over and uh, she fractured her finger and, and, you know, her finger was kind of bent right over like you know not not attached to the rest of, of the finger it was not pleasant it was a dislocation um and um we you know i, I took it to casualty and casualties in the past has always been quite a an annoying place to go you know in that you you would have to sit in a, in uncomfortable chairs and then you'd have to go up to the desk uh, and talk to the receptionist and then you know, sometime later you would meet with a triage nurse and so on. It would be a very long, drawn-out, bureaucratic process. But anyway, I drove my wife to the uh, door of uh, A&E and uh, I was met immediately. There were two nurses there wearing masks and so on. And uh, the nurse just took one look at her finger and said, gosh, that must hurt, you know, come with me. And she told me I couldn't come, um, so I, I went off and drove home. And um, <clears throat> immediately Vivian was seen by um, some practice nurses who, who sorted the finger out and, uh, you know, managed to, uh, to, to, to get it back in the socket and to strap it up and so on. And they then took x-rays and they then f she phoned me and said that uh, I could come and collect her. And the guys drove up to casualty and there she was. You know, somebody bought her out and, uh, and I took her away. But the thing is, the, the NHS... Um, have completely changed the way that casualty operates and it's always taken sick broken people and made them well but it's now much more agile and adaptive and it's responded quickly to new threats so they're prepared to do uh, things in new ways using new technologies so they have you know when where Viv went is called a virtual fracture clinic um, and, and the whole point is that no, you don't have to get involved with a surgeon or a doctor. The nurses can do the fix, the x-ray is taken, and then the doctor or the surgeon actually phones up afterwards to uh, talk about how things have gone and to discuss any further treatment. But it's a completely different way of uh, doing things, which is much more user-friendly. But while we're on the subject of the uh, NHS, <coughs> I just wanted to talk briefly about occupational therapy and how that impacts on our spiritual well-being. And I just begin by explaining that occupational therapy shouldn't be confused with occupational health. Occupational health is about the health of people who are actually in an occupation, in a workplace. But occupational therapy uh, is actually about looking after people, whether they are, um, you know, whether they're actually working uh, whether they're retired um, or whether they're disabled or whether it's for everybody. <clears throat> OT covers both physical and mental health. So, for example, if you needed a joint replacement or, or you had a stroke, it's the OT who helps you to walk again and make sure you were able to manage at home before you were able to leave hospital. 
And in a similar way, if you're an inpatient on the mental health ward, it's the OT who helps you with tailored therapeutic interventions so that you can eventually return home and care for yourself. So, you know, what's the definition of OT? Well, it's a very simple one, but OT is how we occupy ourselves and about what we do. And it may relate to a paid occupation, but it's equally valid for those who are unemployed or retired. And, you know, it includes the things that we used to do in the past. It includes what we can do now, but it also includes the things that we want to do in the future. And this is another kind of a, a very simple... Um, statement if you like. In a nutshell the OT says I can help you with that. So whatever the issues that you're concerned about the OT is the person actually help you to uh, to fix that problem or to work around it or whatever. And my daughter Miranda although not a regular churchgoer talks often about shining a light as an OT in you know for people in a dark place and also about being the hands and feet of Christ. Now, there is a well-known model of OT, um, which is quite simple, and it was put together by somebody called Anne Wilcock, I think, who comes from, it's Canadian. Um, but she talks about doing, being, becoming, belonging, and that's just a summary of what OT is about. Uh, and the reason I mention this, really, is because what I want to do as I go through the categories is explain how they relate to Christianity and our Christian walk and how this model can actually help us to be a balanced Christian, you know, a Christian who's, who's not focused on one particular thing like works. So if we start with doing, doing is about actions, it's about activities, it's about typically the workplace. But connected with doing, there's also the negatives that if we're not doing, we're bored, we may be stressed, we can be anxious. If we then look at doing in terms of Christianity, well, it's the works that we do as Christians. We visit the sick, maybe. We lead worship. We might help in a food bank. We might do youth work. Uh, we might look after the elderly. And then the second category is being. And being is the exact opposite of doing, in a sense. It's existing. It's spending time in solitude. And it's time to dream and to think new ideas and of course in Christian terms that means prayer but even more importantly it means just being still and knowing who God is you know be still and know that I am God and actually hanging out with him not actually interceding and, and, and working through our Bibles but sometimes it's just sitting on a seat in a beautiful place and being aware of his presence and his love and that's what God wants us to do more than anything else. He wants us to hang out with him and know him as a friend. And the third category is becoming. This is what, what, what our aspirations may be. It's about developing, it's about progressing, and it's about changing. And in Christian terms, of course, that means discipleship, doesn't it? This walk, you know, we don't stay as baby Christians. Uh, as new believers but we actually learn more about the Bible and we actually seek to find a calling a mission what's God asking me to do with my life for him and then finally we have belonging and this is really about being part of something about community about activism about shared belief or purpose and this is so important you know if we're going to be uh, mentally healthy we need to be part of a community you don't want to be alone and if we then look at that in the Christian sense it's about building community the church shouldn't just be a closed place where we meet with other Christians almost in secret but the church should be very open we should reach out you know we've often talked about going out of our building to get into the community so it's about outreach it's about sharing hospitality hospitality with those outside the church and of course that's difficult at the moment for us we do the best we can but we can't um, we, we can't be the sort of community we were uh, before COVID 
So let me just uh, summarise what I've said. Um, God is in the restoration business. God will help us to adapt to new situations. And God often says, you know, behold, I'm doing a new thing. And we need to discover who we really are in Christ and allow God to change us into what we were created to be. And we need to think about doing, being, becoming and belonging in a Christian context. We need to try to balance each of these. Beware of focusing too much uh, on doing, for example, but actually spend more time just being, being with God. Later on, I'm going to chat with Miranda, my daughter, about practical mental health tips so that uh, hopefully that will help us get through the slightly scary um, post-Christmas period, you know, when we go down slightly, <laughs> you know, to help us to try and uh, keep, uh, keep in good mental health. Hi, well this is my friend Ringo and Ringo is going to help me with this little section of the, uh, the video. Video, um, Ringo is just going to show you his uh, rather nice sweater. Ringo's one of those dogs who doesn't mind dressing up. You know, he's quite happy to wear a reindeer costume. If you can see that, see he's got the ears. He's happy to wear a rainbow, uh, a reindeer costume as long as the, there might be a treat involved. And you can see that he's, these are new treats. Um, I'm not advertising these, it's, it isn't, but these are actually hero succulent sausages for dogs. So we'll see what he makes of that. And he seems to be enjoying it, he's eating it. And then I've also got some streaky rashes as well, and we'll see if we get to those. Also, if there are any children watching, just to advise that although these are not poisonous, you probably shouldn't eat dog treats. So, you know, just be careful. Ringo still seems quite keen. I'm surprised that he hasn't demanded to go, but I think the thought of the streaky rashes you can see the streaky rashes there. It's quite cool. Now, can you? Would you like to beg for the streaky rasher? Actually, it's probably a bit difficult for him. Can you li lie down for the streaky rasher? That's a good boy. So he's li lay down to have his streaky rasher. Now come up again so people can see you enjoying that streaky rasher. Is that nice? Oh, he's dropped a bit. There you go. What are you eating the rest of it? What did you think of that? Was that nice? Wasn't that good? Do you want to give me a kiss? Give me a kiss. No. Well, good morning. And I, I've talked earlier about my uh, daughter, um, Renda, the OT. So she's now just going to talk to us a little bit about how we can manage our own mental health in these difficult days. And um, so I'm primarily going to talk about low mood, uh, anxiety and depression, um, because those are the main things that are affecting us. There are more serious conditions, but on the whole, we're most likely to be experiencing low mood, and anxiety at the moment because it's dark times. Um, so another key thing to know is that there's low mood which is feeling down but it's something you can manage yourself uh, and you can take self-care steps which we're going to discuss later and then there's clinical depression which is worse and it lasts longer. So if you're feeling really down for more than two weeks um, and if your feelings are making it difficult for you to get jobs done and have a functional life that's when you need to say seek more help otherwise i'd really recommend you just take care of yourself and make yourself feel better um, and i recommend nhs choices they have a lot of information on low mood and depression and anxiety um, and they talk you through the symptoms and help you to figure out if, if this is a significant problem for you so i'd really recommend nhs choices um, to help you with that. So a thing that I think is really important and I want to highlight to you is how to get help when you feel you need it. 
So if you've been unwell for more than two weeks, you can contact. Um, so you could self-refer yourself to um, the NHS Talking Therapy Service. Um, those vary from area to area, so I won't give you a specific name. But if you want to search for IAPT, which stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, um, they can often help you with counselling, with uh, talking groups, that kind of thing. I would warn you that there's a long waiting list at the moment. Um, so if you feel you need something more urgent, it's possibly not the best solution. Um, the next thing is you can contact the GP. Again, if you've had these challenging symptoms, it's been more than two weeks, then do speak to the GP. They will have time for you. They don't prioritise physical conditions. They're looking at what's affecting people and stopping them being able to do things. So that could easily be depression. If you need help sooner than that, and let's face it, GPs are struggling at the moment, then you can ring 111. And again, people associate 111 with a, a more fun practical illness, a more physical illness. Um, but 111 can help with mental health as well. So if you're feeling you need help today or in the next few days, you contact them, they'll decide what level of help you need. They might contact your GP and tell them you need to talk to them, or they might put you through to a mental health professional, um, which is likely to be the same day. So that's well worth considering if you're really unwell. Um, but finally, 999. It's the usual story. People think they can't call 999 for a mental health emergency. Well, you can. If someone's life is at risk or other people are at risk from them, even if you think mental health is the cause, you ring 999, you'll get an ambulance, uh, you can get the police, um, whatever is needed, they will send and it's fine. All the people involved will be trained to manage mental health issues, even the police. So I really strongly can't push that enough. If you feel that there's an imminent crisis, ring 999. Mental health, it doesn't matter. Um, so just to reiterate, if it's going on as a low mood that doesn't affect your function, if it's going on um, for less than two weeks, it's worth trying to manage it yourself. And I know Dad wants to talk about that in a minute. But if um, it's lasted more than two weeks and it's affecting how you cope with your daily living, then you really do need to at the least contact the GP. Um, so I can't reiterate that. And also, 999, if it's an emergency, ring 999. Okay, we're just going to finish by talking briefly about low mood. And I think low mood is something that we're probably all aware of in these difficult days. I know I have uh, frequent uh, days when I'm struggling a little bit. So we're just going to chat about self-care, really, what we can do. Um, where, where would we start, Miranda, with that? What do you think? Sort of like diet? Yeah, I think diet and exercise, they're probably the most crucial things because people are so likely to neglect them and uh, then they become unwell. Yeah, so it's eating good food, you know, things like your five a day and all that. Avoid junk food because that will actually, uh, you know, bring your mood down. Um, Obviously, um, be, be careful at how much alcohol you drink as well. Um, exercise is, is a really good way of lifting your mood. Um, I mean, I'm always going on about it, but just, you know, taking a dog for a walk is a, is a wonderful way. And, and where we live, you know, it's walking up to the top of the hill uh, and looking at the view. It really does uh, make you feel an awful lot better. You see, I mean, there's sort of things like endorphins, isn't there, that come from... Uh, you know, when you're actually exercising, endorphins are released and they actually lift your mood. It's a natural high. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, what about um, being productive? Yes, um, it's, it's a usual story. People know they experience the feelings, but they don't necessarily relate it. Um, a lot of people in the first lockdown found that they really enjoyed baking and everyone was fighting over flour and sugar and fat in order to bake um, and people describe feeling a joy in the process and a joy in completion in having a product that they could share with others um, so clearly that is something that people were self-medicating with even if they didn't realize it yeah. i mean you tried didn't you 
Yes, baking, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it can be just sort of things like simple DIY projects, but anything that, that is creative and that we can complete makes us feel, uh, feel better. Uh, another, I mean, I suppose a more kind of um, less of a doing thing and more about um, being. being, yeah, which is going back to what we, I talked about earlier. Um, you know, it's, it is important to find time to meditate. You know, if we're Christians, we may pray, but it's just being, particularly being still and knowing who God is. But, you know, also there are, you know, if, if you're not particularly a Christian, there are lots of ways that we can meditate and, and just be still and, uh, and find uh, relaxation. What else is there? The final thing is probably belonging, isn't it, really? If, if, you know, we're looking at the, uh, the, 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 the thing we did earlier. Have you got any thoughts on that? You've skipped to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, there is socialising. There's um, attending church, even if it's via Zoom. Um, I don't know where we'll be at by the time this is broadcast. <laughs> but um, any kind of socialising, any kind of event, contact by letter, by email, by phone, um, just a sense of being around other people and staying in contact with the outside world. Anything interactive, really. Um, I think... Uh, uh, thing that Dan's pointed out in the past that's really important is routine. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, just having a routine. Try and, you know, get up uh, about the same time and go to bed at the same time. Uh, and, and the same with, with meals as well, actually eating regular meals rather than just snacking. Yeah, just developing a routine, which you can still vary slightly, but, you know, make sure there are particular things that are healthy, which you do each day and don't just sort of... Uh, you know, lose track of, of time. Um, and I'd also highlight leisure. All of these things we've mentioned are fairly worthy, but leisure is really important. Just cut yourself some slack. Watch some kind of rubbish show, binge watch it on Netflix, whatever it takes. But, you know, make sure that you do leave time to have some shamelessly purposeless fun. Yeah, brilliant. A big thank you to Miranda for... Uh, sharing those tips and, and advice with us. So finally, let's pray for ourselves as individuals. And if you feel lonely, then remember that God loves you unconditionally and has a plan for your life. And if you need help, then don't be afraid to ask for it. You know, many of us are struggling at present and it's normal to feel anxious, afraid and fearful with the current world situation and the fact that we are here in tier four, which is particularly onerous and difficult. You can contact NHS 111, a charity such as Mind or your local church. And now I'm going to pray. Loving God, help us to adapt in 2021 to new ways of working, finding new things to do to match our personal circumstances and to help our neighbours and friends. Thank you, Father, that you work for the good of those who love you. And that you forgive us even when we cannot forgive ourselves. So let's now just be still for a few moments. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to fall upon us now so that we may experience God's perfect love. And you may just want to hold your hands out as a symbol of your openness to him. So Holy Spirit, come now and just speak to us. And Paul tells us in Ephesians, how long, wide, high and deep is the love of Christ. So, you know, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father God, enfold us with your loving arms and hold each of us close to your heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And a final blessing. Lord, please bless us and those we love in these difficult times. Thank you that you are a God of restoration and new things. Amen. So keep safe over the Christmas period and wishing you every blessing in 2021. Thank you. <laughs>